Come for him. Hi there, and welcome back to the Japan Summer Preliminary. I'm Lorinda, and with me is Soto. And we're straight into the second match in this round of 16, which is Kag, which is the guy labelled as K2G versus Gundam Flame. And Kag is a player I have seen play before. He is a known player. He's been in these top eights, top 16s before in Japan. So he's one of the more experienced guys left in this event. And I expect to see good things from him. And he is going to be playing Zoo slash Discard Zoo slash Disco Zoo, whatever you want to call it. Please don't call it Disco Zoo. I we're, don't we're, tend to. We're, we're better than that, Neil. Uh, Gundam Flame, from the other hand, don't know too, no too much about him, but we got some notes. He is a university student, 20 years old, and he is hungry for this tournament because he lost a similar stage during the spring tournament, apparently. So he is hungry for a second chance this time around. And we talked during the first series a little bit how most of the players here in, uh, in the, J the Japanese region have not been favoring the new builds of Zoo. Uh, K2G or Kag is looks like he's going for it, but one of the things that can pick this apart very effectively is exactly this tempo mage hand. Right, um, Arcane Blast for zero mana doesn't seem particularly fair, and Zoo having no way to get rid of the Sorcerer's Apprentice means that tempo mage is getting off to a ridiculously powerful start here. Yeah, most of the time, Zoo has the, the more consistent early game curve in this matchup, so they should spiral a board lead early. Um, it's not as bad a matchup for the Tempo Mage as you'd expect, though, because there's a number of ways that they can climb back into it, right? They 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 have the potential to have a strong opening. As the, oh, it looks like the, is, did he lose the Doom Guard from that? He did. Oh, the Doom Guard, no! Um, but yeah, they can get these powerful early starts uh, with exactly these kind of minions that you're looking at right now. But they also have the opportunity to climb back in in the mid game with a big Flame Waker turn. So the combination of those two possibilities means that the, there are a lot of draws that do potentially line up in the Tempo Mage's favor. But the Zoo player will always feel a little bit hard done by when the Tempo Mage player starts quicker than they do, <laughs> right. considering... You know the the amount of like extra clunkiness that's present in the tempo mage deck that just isn't there in zoo right and just to explain your reaction there because doom guard discarded wasn't always the worst case scenario it's pretty slow card turn five becomes good but now in the new discard version doom guard is insanely powerful not only is it a great card anyway but you quite often just replace the cards using the the imp or yeah, even get something like a silverware going into play from it. So suddenly Doom Guard has gone from being obviously good card, sometimes a tempo swing, to just being the whole cornerstone of the deck. Right. So what what being able to use discard as a card engine primarily, you know, Malkazar's Imp is the card that we see in Kag's hand, which, you know, for every card that you discard, you draw a card to replace it. So it allows you to use cards like Soulfire and Doom Guard as a card engine which then, you know, discard, you know, kind of useless mid-game cards like Argent Squire, Possessed Villager. Like, you don't want those cards on turn six. So you, you throw those cards out of your hand using a Doom Guard or Soulfire. And then all that does is just cycle through the rest of your deck and get you closer to another Doom Guard or Soulfire, which is the cards that you want to be playing in the mid-game. Um, so it's such a powerful engine. Uh, the way that hand was made up, there wasn't really a great discard target. He was going to lose like Malkazar's Imp or Doom Guard or the Defender of Argus. Like a power card was going to go down almost regardless there. But Doom Guard being lost always feels pretty terrible. Yeah. And as you say, the word engine there is absolutely key. I mean, it's not just a card with no downside with the Imp. It actually has an upside, which is right. unbearably silly. So. Awkward looking turn this now. I'd be tempted just to play the, the peddler and then put down the two one drops and try to develop some sort of board before it gets too late. Does playing a one three here ever do anything for you is my question though? Because that that one three is pretty valuable to you. And sure. if you play it on the board here, you are literally just giving it up to a three two. And you know, your your deck usually doesn't play Mortal Coil. You're relying on, on Dark Peddler to be your source of one damage with coils and elven archers and stone tusk balls and things like that so it's such a powerful card but also again i guess having used a lot of his discard mechanics already uh how important is that malkazar's imp as the card engine that we've talked about 
Yeah, and this is actually a very difficult choice because a naught four against two three twos, as again we have no real feedback onto exactly why Hearthstone keeps flashing on and off there, but it seems the players still have some sort of connection to the game. Mm -hmm. But a naught four against two three twos at least forces your opponent to waste two mana pinging or waste his whole turn. Uh, so if you played the one three into that board, you may be able to force a ping. So if it has no value, it's like sapping two mana for the cost of one mana. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can get on board with that. And as I said, the alternative there is just to pick a Void Walker, which just is exactly the same issue as the Malkazar Zim that we talked about. It's just a 1-3 on a board that doesn't really get anywhere. But it looks like he did just go ahead and play the Malkazar Zim here, which is uh, interesting to me because he is pretty much just giving it up for free. So. And it looks like he played the Void Walker as well, right? That thing's taken one damage. So Yes. Uh, that's... I think the Nort 4 may have been better there, just in terms of the way the timing works out. But he chose to go with the 1-3, he's done damage, so he's got ways of killing that, maybe. And, I mean, Gundam Flame is just going to go for the dream here. He's just going to try and nail those two shots on the 2-2. Two -two, and Flame Waker is going to say, You are rewarded, sir, for your faith. There wow. you go, friend. Have a clear board. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, all I can say is, yep, that's all I got, because now Kag is in a world of hurt. Uh, he's going to have to soul fire that, I think, and he's just going to have to work out which card am I trying to get rid of. Do I just go all in and let the uh, defender die, or do I just risk losing my squire? Okay. I mean, maybe this was... Um, was So, clarify for me. Am I calling him K2G, or am I calling him Kag? Kag? Definitely CAG. CAG. Uh, we, right. we had this discussion during spring, and it is CAG, despite the fact he's K2G. All right, cool. So maybe this was his long-term thinking here, was that, sure, we can give up those two 1-3s to the 3-2s in the short term, but I'm then going to plop a 1-5 Darkshire Councilman on the board that will be able to engage with those 1-3s. But what he was not accounting for was the ridiculous tempo of the double spell damage Arcane Blast term. This has just been an absolute dream scenario in terms of a tempo mage draw. And yeah, Kag just says, you know what? Well played. <laughs> right, if you're going to do that, you could have the game. Let's get on with another one. It is best of seven. Keep reminding you guys of that. So definitely just wants to move on and not see that tempo mage again. And the tempo mage just didn't draw any of its yogs and its cabalist tomes if he has those or... Any uh, Medivh, whatever whatever high end he's put in there just never came to light there. Yep. Um, yeah, not not really a lot else that you can say about that. Um, like the as I said, Tempo Mage is a deck that has these clunky mid game things in there. You know, Azure Drakes, Cabalist Tomes, as you said, Fireballs, Yogg-Saron, You know, all this stuff that you can potentially draw in your opening hand. That it it makes the openings inconsistent, but it is one of the most powerful decks in the game when it gets its its dream curve, right? It's it's an interesting yeah. thought experiment to just line up the nuts of every single deck against each <laughs> yeah. other and just decide who wins. And like Tempo Mage comes out pretty favorably in that list. And Flame Waker, I hadn't realized quite how disliked that card is until Firebat published his list of um, sort of Reddit feedback on cards to be banned from tournaments, and Flame Waker was massively high on that list. I cannot stand that card. I, I hate it so much. I, Tempo Mage used to be an honest deck where you played a Zombie Chow on turn one, and then you did some stuff with Sorcerer's Apprentice and Unstable Pools, and then they printed Flame Waker, and they there goes the neighbourhood. The deck just became a clown fiesta. A clown fiesta, indeed. Of course, it was an honest, good, honourable deck back when you used to play it. Yeah, exactly. That is <laughs> primarily what I'm saying here, Lorinda. Congratulations. <laughs> so, it's okay when you do it. When someone else does it, it's not fair anymore. Exactly. So, production quality has gone up there. There is now something with the TV with the casters on. So, we now have a, a, a visual cue, at least, as to what's going on during some of this stuff. So, that's going to help us out, at least. Yep, so just running through the uh, oh. deck lineups here, it's going to be uh, Kag going with his variation of the Tempo Mage here, but I have to say the words Tempo Mage through gritted teeth looking at this opening hand as we are staring at not one, but count them, two entire Cabalist Tomes. 
And at sometimes we're going to have to th- agree, because I think every caster now says this is no longer called Tempo Mage, but we have to call it Tempo Mage because everybody else calls it Tempo Mage. Can we just like get a union or something and agree to call it something different? Yog Mage? I mean, let's let's be real. That's what the deck is, right? Yeah. It's, it's a Yog deck. <laughs> <laughs> Double Cabalist Tome indeed makes it a Yog deck. Why else yep. would you want eight? useless spells in your deck <laughs> that's think about how many shatters you can get from two cabal don't even do deck. that to me as subtle references the first time i ever cast well played the get deck i pointed out that i've got an open mind but cabal is tome i'll just see what happens and the first time i ever cast it, i got three shatters yeah i am an eyewitness to that happening it was literally three shatters without a word of a lie Trying so hard to have that open mind, that game. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, not quite the uh, explosivity from Cag here with his opening. Just mirror images down on the board here. But I mean, I do like this. This is a play that honestly, like back in the early days of Hearthstone, where no one really understood, you know, the tempo pushes and the board leverage that you could really have in Hearthstone. And every thought, everyone thought Hearthstone was a, a pure card for card value game, right? right. Like, Everyone just played Arena and Constructed was this weird niche that no one really bothered with. Like, turn one mirror image would get you laughed out of the building. But as time has gone on, you can understand the point of this play, right? Like, when you want to develop a two drop on the next turn, you don't want your opponent to be able to tempo into it by trading on their terms with their minions. So yep. you put these useless walls in the way, and that twists the texture of the game to mean that you are in charge of how the significant significant minions interact with each other right and it did give him the option unlikely though it was to not play the apprentice on turn two if for some reason he right. felt there was yeah, a better yeah. option yeah but, i mean like what is the harm of having the zero twos on the board right for exactly a, a yeah uh, you're going to play them anyway with no diff- okay that's a good pickup just changing my course there for a second <laughs> he now has a lot of options here suddenly he does um it's it's car i mean if he if he games to draw cards here he can pick up you know arcane blasts frost bolts any of that kind of stuff um to be able to use in mm-hmm. tandem with the arcane missiles or he can try and go down the spell damage route instead which also has the added benefit of getting him an extra three twos worth of tempo on the board of course this is a a very tempo based matchup this game is going to be decided more or less by who is in control of the board come around the time in a game where the card doomhammer exists and he's going to go for that route. And the downside of this route, if he does go for it, is that his arcane intellect probably won't be castable next turn because the chances are that source, uh, the apprentice is going to get traded off here. Yeah. So if, if, that's why he was thinking so long. He now has to probably give up either the blood mage or the arcane intellect next turn. Yeah, I mean, it looks and, like he's considering his options here, like whether he even casts the arcane missiles, which minion, if, if he's better off attacking into a minion first to tilt the odds in his favor. And in the end, he just decides that slap face and hold the missiles is the right line here. So he does still have that blood mage in hand that he can pair with the missiles, does of course have flame waker in his deck as well for a later date to pair with that arcane missiles for huge value. There's a good chance that costs him a ping next turn though. So assuming that the um, apprentice is gone, Mm-hmm. Then next turn he has the opportunity to do something like Blood Mage into missiles, and that means he wouldn't be able to now ping because it will cost one, not zero. So sure. I think I'd like him to have launched those missiles and sort of set up the next turn. I think personally. Okay. Um, but from uh, from Gun and Flame's side here, he has a hand that would love to see some spell damage right now. So he he rolls the totem, gets the taunt totem. And he has Maelstrom Portal and the new card that you just saw flashed up on screen there, Spirit Claws, which of course gets buffed from a one power weapon to a three power weapon if you have spell damage in play. So his hand is very much in need of some spell damage right now, but he just takes the passive turn for now. He's going to decide whether he wants to direct this Totem Golem. He saw his opponent play a Cult Sorcerer last turn, and leave one mana open. Right. So he knows, since there was a Sorcerer's Apprentice on the board, there's no Frostbolt in hand, there's no Arcane Blast in hand. Both of those cards would have been snap yep. played in that situation. So he is going to choose to respect the Sorcerer's Apprentice more than the source of spell damage in this situation. But that could potentially come back to bite him now with the Spell Power Arcane Missiles still being in play. Right, and again, Cag's got 
Very interesting decision here because he can... Presumably he's going to bump the 3-2 into the 0-2. Uh, and then give himself the maximum chance for these missiles to hit. But now he's... The way he's choosing to sequence it is taking the chance that they will hit. So he doesn't have to play the Blood Mage. And now he can draw some cards. Or he can just put up a wall of taunts and garbage. See, I... Like... I end up with this line no matter what happens. I would personally would have made the trade into the zero two, played the blood mage Thanos, fired off the missiles, taken that one extra missile, seeing sure. if I can clear the board with it. If not, slam up the mirror images and the tunnel trogs isolated for a turn anyway. So um I personally would have liked to see the blood mage come down first there. Obviously he gave himself this isn't just oh what an no, idiot sure. he missed spell damage. He decided he'd rather have the ping left open for him. But in my world, I'm just not really bothered about pinging that turn. If, if I have to leave a 2-1 trog alive, attacking into some mirror images and then ping it next turn, no big deal. I'm happy doing that. Yeah, that makes sense. And Keg in a fairly fortuitous spot here, that, as much as he can be in this mess, that Gundam Flame hasn't got any spell damage. That deck does tend to run... And I haven't seen his list at the moment, but it does tend to run like Blood Mage and yeah. other spell damage. And Melson Portal would just be a complete blowout as opposed to the, the decent sized blowout it is now. And there's a card that does nothing on this turn. That is five mana do nothing into your opponent's uh, Tunnel Trog and Doomhammer. So yeah, not what he was going to be looking for here. I think he is just obligated to ping here, which means we're going to see Arcane Intellect instead of the Cabalist Tome being cast. Right, do you intellect first and hope to protect your um, blood mage, or do you bump first and see what you pick up? Uh, I think I like the arcane intellect line a little bit more, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, just comparing the two lists that we've just seen, uh, Kag does have the slower, clunkier list. Gundam Flame did build his list a little bit quicker, so you can say in a way he was entitled to get that big blowout start that he got. That's how he's built his deck. That's what he's built his deck to do. Uh, Kag, on the other hand, is going for the slower, more value-based approach and adding more fuel to that Yog fire in the late game. And you can see that his draw is just so much more clunky than we saw from Gundam Flame in the previous game. Yeah. So going at it from the other direction, he's still turned six and yep. he's just taken the first damage he's going to take. He has double Firelands Portal in hand as well as an Azure Drake to draw something with. And he does have that Yog hanging around for turn 10. So he's obviously all in on the Yog play, hence Yog Mage. Mm -hmm. But it looks like he's got a decent chance of getting there from where he's sat right now. We can see there's a lot of gas in Gundam Flame's hand, though. There is there is a large quantity of damage going to go through here. Looks like he's going to use his Rock Buyer to tidy up the Drake, which is interesting. He had a Maelstrom Portal there for two. Uh, into the Drake, hit the Drake once with the Doomhammer, and then just develop the 7 7 alongside that. Keep the Rock Biter for the full 10 damage to face on a later date. So I personally like that line a little bit more because it kind of exchanges the, the minion damage from a Maelstrom Portal mm -hmm. into face damage because um, you don't invest so much of your face damage into the Azure Drake. But uh, he's just going with the, uh, the solid line here of, uh, of, of um, Rock Biter into the Azure Drake. So. He's left himself a little bit short on damage in hand, but still an incredibly imposing board position for him. And those Fireland portals in hand that looked so promising for Kag just a little while ago are not looking so hot right now. Wow. Firelands and hot. Sotor absolutely burning it up today. Uh, yeah, so are there any charge minions he can get from these seven drops? Because at some point he's going to probably just have to go for an incredibly unlikely roll, like try to roll a Leroy or something. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, five-mana charge minions you may have heard of. Leroy Jenkins being one of them, Doomguard being another, two of the, the absolute strongest outcomes from a Firelands portal on top of, like, Earth Elemental as well, so... I mean, sometimes you just have to decide that your outs are so limited, like the old days with everybody misses fondly, I'm sure, with piloted shredders, mm. where you just bump in and take your one in 80 chance of dropping a Doomsayer. Yeah, or like Annoyatron or something, right? Yeah. So the only way I win is if this is Annoyatron. Hello, hell. <laughs> yeah, and your opponent has to make sure to play around that as well. So, you know, back in those days that was a thing, but now, you know, you can't play around the portals. You just kill your opponent instead. So now Gundam Flame has to decide, is it just go time? Is that Drake relevant to my interests? He says yes. 
He's going to trade the damage into it. He's going to send four more damage to face, sending Kag down to 14. He had the option to push an extra four there, meaning Kag would be at 10, backing it up with this board. Whoa. A Spirit Claws that deals nine and a Lightning Bolt that deals three. Of course, that nine is slow damage coming over the course of three more turns. So um, I, I guess I can get on board with this decision. It, it will come down a lot i guess to whether or not he he knows or expects his opponent to be running flame strike as to whether he needs to get this game over with quickly because if if there's no flame wow. strike in the deck the only thing he needs to be worried about is yogs are on on turn 10 so as long yeah. as the game is over by then then it should be fine uh babbling book is an interesting card uh when you first look at it it doesn't seem particularly great but something we've seen it doing is actually it does a remarkably good job of trading into something early game and also surprising your opponent. The cards you get seem to be fairly decent. Uh, has it exceeded your expectations? As we go through the motions here, basically, that's why I'm... Uh, no, no, it has not. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the question. Not a fan. No, uh, I think uh, Babbling Book is potentially a good card in a control mage deck that just isn't refined and doesn't really exist yet right uh but in these um you know tempo mage mid-range mage yog mage style builds i just don't think it does enough on average to justify a spot in your deck like there's nothing wrong with the card but it's just so low impact on average that i'm just looking at that spot in my deck and thinking do i really want a one mana one one here okay so yeah I, I can't. Yeah, you, you just said it. Yeah, you, you're not a fan. That's it. End, <laughs> end, end of that discussion, and on to the next game. The, I think. The, the words that you're looking for. <laughs> then, Neil. Uh, looking for the ice block here, which would have got him into Yog. Yeah, didn't uh, get it. That didn't is get it. A mirror entity and a counter spell, I believe, alongside the Frost Nova. If you are uh, struggling with the Japanese text, I hope I got that right. Uh, Frost Nova and somehow freeze your face isn't happening either. Nope. One mana healing spell that we've never seen before. Oh, this is interesting. He's going for the bluff. Yep. Might as well. Why not, right? Might I mean, make why not? But your opponent's still going to try and proc the block. So yeah, of course. But like you know, you you might make your opponent do something monumentally stupid, right? There is no harm right. in just letting it happen and play out the motions. You know, your opponent's brain might just fry in terms of how he's supposed to deal with an ice block. So there's no harm in doing it. It's like literally seventh decimal point one percent chance of actually doing anything relevant. But. Why but not? Why not? We've seen yeah. players make monumentally silly mistakes in games. So if you can give them a chance for that to happen, then I have nothing wrong with people doing it. As again, it's not ladder. There's no hurry to get on with this. No, absolutely not. And so we have seen one Tempo Mage deck being successful and one not quite so Tempo Mage deck being uh, less than successful. And it, it really was live or die by those starts. Like, um, uh, Cag's mage just just didn't really have that explosivity at the start of the game to really compete on board with the shaman. Right, and I mean the the idea of Gun and Flame getting back here is that he said he failed last time and wanted to do better this time. He's going to be pretty excited about those prospects. It is a best of seven. It's not best of five, so you know nowhere near in the bag yet. But getting those two decks out of the way nice and early and taking down zoo honestly is a pretty good thing i know the zoo gets another go but any wins against zoo are like bonus wins at the moment yeah i mean from our perspective yes because we we think zoo is one of the strongest decks in the meta that seems to be you know a, a theme throughout a lot of the western scene right now is people are kind of engaged in this arms race trying to find this the optimal build of zoo you know we've seen yeah. Early on, people going really all in with, you know, Tiny Knight of Evil and Succubus and nonsense like that. And then it kind of got refined down to, well, no, you don't need all that stuff. Like, let's just play one extra discard card with the Librarian and get the Silverware Golems in there. And then that's enough. And we've seen players like Muzzy experimenting with, like, the, the six demons into Demon Fire kind of build. Um, that's been successful for him as well. So um, over in the Western Hemisphere, there is a lot of experimentation going on with Zoo, but... As I mentioned during the first series, there just isn't as much representation of Zoo here in this Japanese tournament as I would expect there to be. And if there is a deck that is better than Zoo, it's this one. Just which, which deck is that, Neil? Not the one with the babbling book. Okay. So, Druid, 
at the pro level with all the options it gives you. It gives you a nice curve. You're constantly providing threats, but also gives you options to deal with opposing threats at the pace you want to deal with them. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think that at pro level, the Druid deck at the moment is right up there with the very best decks, possibly that we've ever seen beyond Patron and things like that. Uh, behind Patron, but above anything else, I think. It's it's definitely up there. It's pretty gross. There there have been some disgusting decks in the time of Hearthstone. Like that's let's not oversell it. You know, we we do live in a world yeah. where uh, where Undertaker Hunter is in our history. <laughs> where uh, you know, a eight mana Pyroblast Freeze Mage was is in our history. There's there's been some pretty disgusting things as time's gone on. But yeah, this is a very very strong deck for sure, and it's a deck that's been uh, terrorizing the meta for a long time at this point. And Arcane Giants have honestly only served to increase its power level even more. Right, and something that people are doing now, as you can see, with this Moonfire, this Maligos build, um, because the deck is so powerful, it's got space to do silly things with Maligos Moonfire. And Moonfire is a crazy card. It's almost equally effective on turn 1 as just killing off a Fiery Bat, say, as it is on turn 10, where it starts killing off six sixes or anything sixes, of course. So... It's been pretty crazy. And, of course, you get the combo killer against uh, control as well thrown in there. But we don't see enough control for that really to be a thing at the moment. Yeah, it is primarily used as a tempo card in this deck, honestly. like Back in the day, you would see Malagos decks just purely being used as um, that combo killer. Like you say, like Malagos would just be hoarded and you'd try and pick up a bunch of damage in your hand and just send it all at face. But... The meta exists in a place right now where just like a lot of decks just aren't capable of dealing with Malagos. And if they are, you know, if your opponent's deck plays two executes, well, you have two Violet Teachers and a Fandral and, and two Arcane Giants in your deck to soak up those executes before the, the Malagos ever comes down. So a lot of the time you can just drop Malagos on the board. Your opponent can't deal with it. And you just ride the back of that tempo all the way to victory. Yeah, I mean, who knew that a deck that synergizes heavily with spells works well with naught mana spells, right? Mm. When you word it like that, sometimes these things seem obvious, but it usually takes somebody with a lot of insight to actually put it in there in the first place. Every zero mana card in the history of Hearthstone, with a few exceptions, has been broken at some point in time. And Moonfire was one of those exceptions. Another one of those exceptions is Totemic Might. And there right. is a deck emerging that might be a very, very powerful deck when it gets refined. So you can see even these like joke cards, honestly, like yeah. when you make a card cost zero mana, at some point, somebody will do something broken with it. Yeah, and I'm fairly sure at some point, even Wisp, I mean, the ability to put a minion down, we've talked about the how important one attack is in the current meta. Right. Even a card like that is a card that people won't want to fall off their radar. Yep. Uh, the ability for something like Zoo just to put down a 1-1 one, one on turn 1, alongside its other two cards that it played <laughs> with the coin, and then just draw them back later, is probably a thing that people at least pay attention to. That is a that's a serious level of advocacy for the card Wisp. You know, I'm just, I'm We've got to try, man. We've got to try and promote <laughs> all of the cards. Next week, we'll go through... Something like your favorite card, I think. Um, two, three that gives things charge. Oh, that doesn't exist anymore. Wow, savage. <laughs> so, Raven Idol cast, uh, Living Roots, Starfall, and another Moonfire here. Living Roots, fantastic card. Moonfire, of course, synergizes with the Malagos as well as the Living Roots does as well. But is there ever any consideration for the Starfall? Because there are a big chunk of three twos in this deck that are pretty threatening. And yeah, Gundam Flame says yes, he wants that Starfall in his hand. Yeah, I mean, his game plan at the moment is, it's really difficult. Like with Druid, you do have to project ahead. He knows he's going to start drawing into Nourishers and into Minions very soon, but he doesn't quite know how soon soon is. <laughs> so he's going to just keep removing stuff until it is his time. And I honestly just think that is just always the line against Tempo Mage. Um, if you... Kill every minion that Tempo Mage plays for long enough, they really quickly run out of win conditions because most of these decks have cut pure win conditions like Archmage Antonidas, like Ragnaros from their deck. Yeah. Um, and they've, they've refined the deck down to early tempo plus mid game spells plus Yogg. Like, right. regardless of like which ratio of spells you have, you know, more Cabalist Tomes, more Firelands Portals, Flame Strike, whatever, like, that is still the makeup of your deck in some ratio. 
So if you can get past the early minion stage of the game without taking too much damage, that Yogg is going to have to do something pretty mind-blowing to actually be able to, to get enough of a foothold back in the game. Right, and against Druid, the Druid quite often has enough stuff that even if your Yogg is really good, they, they the Druid still sort of keeps coming back the next turn at you. And, of course, can counter with its own Yogg as well. I mean, Yogg counters Yogg pretty hard. It does. And now we can potentially see that Moonfire put to good use here. The power of the Wild pickup is really interesting, though, because now he might want to pair that Violet Teacher. So he had uh, Violet Teacher, Innovate, Swipe, Moonfire for a, a full board clear mm -hmm. and a bunch of uh, a bunch of 1-1s one on the board. Uh, but now having picked up the power of the wild, he might want to pair those things together. And it looks like he is going to go for the little bit of a greedy line, just use the swipe, try and pair that teacher power of the wild combo together on a later turn. Yeah, that He'll makes sense to me, especially as he has more draws to make that turn even more ridiculous. Like if he picks up an innovate, for instance. Right. He also has a unknown secret to deal with right now that could, of course, potentially be mirror entity. So that could affect his Violet Teacher turn as well. So he's considering various options now as to uh, what that, that secret in play could be. And two cards, two decks, or well, two hands full of cards right now. And mm. that's something that I like to see because it means that both players are having to put a lot of effort into their turns rather than you know, just when people curve out and their, their hand is empty. And most people can't make too much of a mess of that. But these hands, you've got to really think what you're doing. And yeah, he's he's managed to make a pretty imposing board this turn. After he's just seen a swipe, going wide on the board makes a lot of sense for him. If Gundam Flame tries to drop minions oh. straight back into this, then uh, Kag knows that he has all the answers between the secret that he has in play already and the Firelands portal that is honestly such a good card in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Dealing five is just right where you want to be against Druid most of the time. So... Um, between all those options that he has in play, he knows that he can beat the minion line, and he's just seen a swipe used. So he probably thinks his opponent's uh, options for being able to tidy this board up are quite limited. But surprise, there is a starfall in your opponent's hand. And Gundam Flame playing this very patiently. Again, he had the option to do something like Violet Teacher into Innovate, and then Starfall, and then Moonfire, the remaining minion. It would have lowered the cost of that Arcane Giant, but he's happy just to take his time. And something we've seen with people who play Druid well is they get the maximum out of their cards by not rushing and making sure they use all the removal really efficiently. Yep. Ouch. And a little bit of lost patience. Kag gets the summoning stone. He will be ruining the, the, the fact that the interaction does not work in the way that some people expected it to, where the, the free seven drop comes out of the summoning stone <laughs> as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's basically just Kag losing patience here. Honestly, he feels like he needs to go. And honestly, I don't blame him because, as I said, Gundam Flame had, had navigated through that early game period where he'd cleared out the early onslaught without taking a significant amount of damage. And when you're staring at your, your Druid opponent at 26 life, who's already cleared basically all of your minions, you're sat with a, an Azir Drake and a Dream in your hand. It's, it's really, really hard to visualize a win condition. So... Kag just decided that he had to go that turn and start firing all of this damage at face and try and push through. Right, and for where Kag is sat, um, he doesn't think he's got to do 21 or 22 damage with some armor ups. He thinks he's going to have to do something like 29 or or even more, depending on the number of portals that come out of Raven Idols, depending on Feral Rages in his opponent's deck. Yep. Uh, so he's looking at... We're looking at thinking, well, he can probably burn him down, but he's looking at doing a lot more damage than just the health total on the screen. And here you see, you know, you mentioned Gundam Flame's patience here. And I think a big part of the reason for that patience is that mirror entity that you've just seen activated. He was looking for his opportunity to, to neutralize that mirror entity effectively because he would have had his suspicions, right? Like yeah. he's, he's more or less down to ice block or mirror entity at that point. So he was looking for his opportunity to neutralize it perfectly, which he now has. And now, suddenly, all the big boys in his hand can start to come out to play. And he has got some crazy Violet Teacher setups coming up soon with that Arcane Giant. Right, so his hand is probably going to slowly but surely get wiped out by Kag's hand. But the trouble is, Kag's hand is Kag's win condition. Yes. And Gundam Flame is just going to draw more big <laughs> things. Nailed it! Three Arcane Missiles directly to the dome. 
And that's a decent roll, I think, there for him. An extra two damage from this Abomination does actually set up sort of lethal in quite a lot of circumstances here. Yeah, really does. I mean, it's it's a, an oft-forgotten factor of, uh, of Abomination, the fact that it deals two damage to both players' faces as well. And when he's just trying to make the push with double Fireball and Frostbolt in hand, that big old pile of burn that he amassed is looking like it's going to be able to do the job here because... As you said, Kag will be sitting back and waiting, okay, saying, all right, where's the Moonglade portal? Where's the Feral Rage? Like, what life gain am I going to have to beat this game? Oh, and Gundam Flames made his choice here. We're going to see some Yogs, I think. Are we really? We're going to see what uh, he drew. He's picked up an extra, he's picked up a Wrath here, so this could still be a Yog turn. There is a potential Innovate Yog, but... I think now he'll develop the board instead. Right, having now dealt with the problem of the Abomination, I'm pretty sure we're going to see the board development line instead. Which means uh, he'll lose, by the yeah, way. Yeah, which means Maya Keeper, Violet Teacher, Innovate Power of the Wild looks pretty, but the ugly but effective route of double Fireball to the face beats a free 0 mana 8A all day long. And that's interesting. I, I thought that Gundam Plane was playing that well, and I still stand by that, by taking the patient route. But actually, Kag thought, if you're going to be patient, I'm going to go, and I'm just going to see what happens. And he's won the game with Azur Drake, Frostbolt, and Cabalist Tome still in hand, and Arcane Intellect. So there's more damage to follow if there was a heal as well. Yeah, he had room to go, um, but the the recognition from Kag there is like, he, he realised he had to go, right? He, he cast... Firelands Portal at face on a turn where he could have played an Azure Drake on an empty board. Mm -hmm. um, which most players would have looked at and gone, this seems fine, right? Yeah, play my draw Drake. a card, carry on. Right, play my Drake, decent chunky body, draw one more card. But he just looked at his hand and went, you know what? A, this thing does five damage to face right now. It gets me a minion in play, probably of a similar size to the Azure Drake. Little did he know he was going to end up with a summoning portal, but, you know, so such is the luck. <laughs> And then was able to back that up with more Firelands portals and the rest of the damage that he had in hand. And like it was just really strong recognition from Kag to just say, all right, the, the time for just playing on board is over. I'm just going to send this damage downtown and we're going to see who wins this race. Yeah, and a very important game, obviously. I mean, everything's always a difference of two, so every game is important. So not even going to go down that rabbit hole too far. But it's now 2-1 to Gundam Flame. And he's going to have to find a win with his druid at some point which he should and i wonder if kag will take this opportunity to requeue his zoo again it's conquest he's probably just rolling dice and yeah just to reiterate you know we are basically just rebroadcasting the the feed that we are being given from the japanese team here we do not get the production notes and everything that the japanese casters get so we don't have information on what the bands are so we can't give you uh full information but i can i can give you the lineups in general the five decks brought by uh gundam flame are dragon warrior a the yog mage the mid-range hunter the malagos druid and the aggro shaman whereas kag has a uh mid-range shaman the yog mage zoo uh, a Yog Druid and Control Warrior, in fact. Oh, that's a new deck. Interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, it looks like Gundam Flame is going with his Dragon Warrior here. And uh, Kag, as you said, has taken the opportunity to re queue the zoo here. So he is going to put his faith back into the explosive starts of zoo, the swingy potential of the discard mechanics. But this is a deck that, uh, you know, classically warrior was was kind of a terror in like when we yeah. when you saw the 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 beatles lineup the fab four lineup like go up against each other over and over again you would see warrior get banned because warrior was just so well positioned amongst those four decks because it generally beat aggro shaman and it generally mm -hmm. beat zoo um but the the discard power adding in extra soul fires to your deck which can just snipe out so many of the mid-game minions cleanly that actually makes a big deal. And if you can get a big swingy turn with a discard mechanic in this matchup now, that makes a huge difference. But you know what else makes a huge difference? Having four fiery war axes in your deck. Yes, indeed. Alex Straza's champion, the bane of Zoo's existence, the bane of any aggro deck's existence, just coming out, charging for value, picking up an immediate two for one, and that is just a, like just full tempo over to the Dragon Warrior, just like that. Right, and Kag's hand is pretty slow 
It's about as slow as a zoo deck can get. Obviously, the M Gang boss was a good pickup last turn, but you know, these four and five drops are just not what you want here because they're just, just too clunky to take on Alex as a champion and his good friends. Yeah, he wants he, he does want to just explode here onto the board and go a little bit wider. Like Im, Im Gang boss on three in any matchup that's about contesting the board early is just the dream. But from here, like next turn, he would love to be, you know, be playing a two drop and two one drops, right? Like really just exploding onto the board. That's not going to be possible for him right now. So he's going to have to uh, find something cute here. And uh, Kag, I guess, is just playing a little bit of a cute game here with his opponent. Yeah. We're saying, you went face last turn. I'm going to call your bluff and go face this turn. And then if you go face again on the following turn, then I get to really yes. punish you with Defender of Argus. And I was going to mention that because I've seen this interaction between players happening more and more. Like, the guy who's supposed to trade choosing not to, and supposed in inverted commas, mm -hmm. and then the other guy saying, you know what? No, you're supposed to be the guy who trades. I'm going to hit you in the face and put you back in that spot. Uh, didn't work out for CAG this time, but that's an interaction I'm seeing more and more in, in all levels of play in the last, literally in the last two or three weeks. I think, so I think there's a pride thing that comes into it as well. I'm sure you've had this experience as a Hearthstone player where, you know, we're, we're familiar of the, with the mm -hmm. concept of free damage, right? Where an attack should go face because there's no punish for it. Right. Um, and your opponent will do that to you and you will say, damn, he's right. That was free damage. I have to trade into him now, right? But you, you don't want to concede that point to your opponent. You so don't you want just to hit them in the face and right. say, no, because, damn you, you're wrong. Right, because you're too prideful to say, to like admit that your opponent has made the correct play and got free damage in on you. So I think you know we can see some stubbornness coming out between top players yeah. in that sense. But in that particular instance, that was just a gambit from CAG to say, will my opponent let me get Argus value here? And the answer was a resounding no from Gundam Flame. Yeah. Definitely an, an interesting line that he chose to take. And like I say, it's a line that I think we're going to see more and more as players really push the edges of everything they can do in Hearthstone. And I think Kag probably just has to you know, bite the bullet here and play this Doom Guard. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty. Um, especially if, I mean, from his perspective, we can see that it is reality. But from his perspective, he'll be thinking, all right, Doom Guard into the Frothing Berserker here. And then he just has Blackwing Corruptor on curve. Like, how do I win from there? Um, unfortunately, Kag is going to get the bad news that that is exactly reality right now. But can you even play around that by I trading mean, into the Fairy Dragon instead? The problem is where the other reality exists is he wants to do this before the Ravaging Ghoul comes down and makes that Frothing Berserker into an absolute menace. Yep. And both of those things exist. So. Yep. Completely um, agree. He just has to go for it and hope that those things aren't there. And they are. And his hand is not equipped to deal with this onslaught. Yeah, that is a brutal Blackwing Corruptor from Gundam Flame. The the Doomguard just really didn't get anything done there. We're used to Doomguard just being such a huge swing for Zoo on the turn that it's played. But, I mean, honestly, he spent five mana and discarded two cards, killed a minion and left a 5-3 on the board. Gundam Flame just did the same thing with a 5-4 and without discarding any cards. Well, as is the power of the Dragon Warrior. And of course, back in the day, Dragon decks were using these cards to that advantage, but they just didn't have the inbuilt synergy and the four fiery war axes to really make... Yeah, <laughs> they just didn't have Alex Strauss as champion. They didn't let the bad draws sort of go for them. And, and you can now play Fairy Dragon because of the synergy in the deck, whereas before you wouldn't play it because... If you're playing Fairy Dragon, the theory was, well, you had to play on turn two, so it's not pumping your other dragons. Yep. But now the synergy of the deck is Alex Strauss as champion, so I can keep my Fairy Dragon as an activator and still have good two drops going on. Absolutely, and these are some fairly miserable looking <laughs> wow. uh, peddler options, honestly. I, I was going to say the corruption just looks like the favourable choice here because he needs to get rid of that 5-2, and right now he just has no way to do that, but... The 5-4 five, the five, can just pick up a, a favourable trade right now if it wants to. Or, honestly, there's nothing wrong, really, with just jamming all of this damage to yeah. face in this position. I think against Zoo, I mean, it's just going to be personal taste because it's 99% plus, right, no, by the no, way. No, there is no question. If he's picked up Hunter, this damage is 100% okay. going yeah, face. Because now he's going to be able to set up the lethal. But, there you go. Um, yeah, the other way around, just killing everything against Zoo is usually the safest option when you're dealing in those tiny percentages. Yeah. Uh, who cares? 3-1.
kind of going to give it up, and I've, I've harped on this point significantly, Lorinda, but it, it seems like a, a, an important discussion point in this tournament so far is that not too many players have had faith in Zoo in terms of bringing it as part of their lineup. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, we've seen Zoo as such a staple in the tournament lineup for such a long time. And now we've seen Zoo honestly just getting stronger based on the Karazhan expansion in yep. a lot of people's opinions. But in this tournament, the Japanese lineup of players in this tournament, most of them have chosen not to bring Zoo. And now we see a player who has chosen to bring Zoo, who you said you you know you picked out as potentially one of the strong points yes. in this lineup, someone that you've seen as a powerful player. And Zoo could potentially be his downfall here now, as he's had two losses with the deck already. Yeah, this is the sort of thing that forms a meta. If there's already a little bit of lack of confidence in a deck, and then they see somebody who actually brings that deck go 0-2, mm -hmm. like that snowballs into a, a national meta at least, and possibly in the international one. There's you know a lot of pro players will be watching this around the world. They may have to well, there's a good chance they have to play one of these guys at BlizzCon, so people will be watching this, and yeah, that can snowball into meta game changes you know really rapidly. Uh, we see people who are being priest doing really badly in tournaments because everyone thinks it's terrible. And the few people who bring it do terribly. That just snowballs the belief that, well, <laughs> why work on this class? Wow. Do you really have to kick Priest while they're down? I think it's a good time. I don't want him that to was, steal my that was, stuff. That was just so damning. It's like, yeah, no one brings Priest because it sucks. It turns out when you bring it, it sucks. <laughs> That's basically what you just said, right? And it's, it's just like... me that said that. Right? I get all the blame for, for the downfalls there. Yeah. Yeah, Pri Priest is dead in 2016, confirmed by Neil Lorinda Bond. Yeah, at least until right. the next set, where I think it'll probably be the best class ever. All right, fair enough. So Gundam Flame is queuing up his uh, Yogg Druid here, which means his mid-range Hunter was the deck that was banned by, by CAG. Uh, CAG is playing that Control Warrior in his lineup, he so maybe is. he got out outplayed at the pick ban stage. Mm. Sure. Um, but this is just going to come down to a good old-fashioned Yogg-Off. Yep. And I'm going to nail my colours bravely to the mast of the guy who's got two innovates in his hand. <laughs> that is a brave and bold prediction, Neil Bond. And now he has <laughs> the double violet teacher. I'm slightly more sure. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, Wild Growth is extremely powerful in this matchup. The the consistent mana advantage of Wild Growths and Nourishes are often more powerful than the one-off spikes of Innovate uh, in this in this mirror match. But when you are sat on double Innovate and your opponent is sat on no mana acceleration until my Keeper on four, then that is a very different story. Right, and you've got an excuse to just Innovate out the Violet Teacher next turn. You know, just, just make one more thing. And it's just... A 3-5 body with upside is completely ludicrous. And that's... Just Gundam Flame is so much trouble here on turn two. Yeah, I mean, turn one teacher, turn two teacher, turn three wrath. Looks like a world I would quite want to live in every single druid game. Yeah, just Raven Idol into Innovate, into wrath. I don't even know why I thought of that, but that's horrible. I don't know why... Okay, so in the real world, we're just going to innovate out this Violet Teacher. He doesn't have to. Uh, he doesn't, you're right. There is merit here to Wrath, for sure. Um, because you, you preserve, basically, the integrity of your first Violet Teacher mm -hmm. entirely. Um, you then open yourself up to Living Roots draws and Raven Idol draws on the, the following turn, which will then make your Innovate Violet Teacher play even more powerful on the next turn. And you can still Wrath again, or you can Innovate, Innovate into your 5-drop, like you say. Yep. So, would give you more options, and something I've been talking about a lot with the Druid is to keep your options open, but he decides that putting 7 attack down on turn 2 and hitting someone in the face with removal backup is probably pretty good. And I do find it difficult to dispute that decision. I mean, I, I elaborate on the line straight away. It looked like turn 1 teacher, turn 2 teacher to me, regardless the... The Wrath option was definitely valid, but really, do you, do you ever turn down the opportunity to have two Violet Teachers on the board on turn two? I don't think so. I don't think so either, but I, I like to look at every option, um, partly because I'm casting the game, so I, I should probably do that. Are you? But... Wow. When did that Whoa! <laughs> Ouch. I've just been Gundam flamed out of the broadcast, guys. 
so <laughs> Nourish being picked up here. He had the option for another Moonfire, but Moonfire just uh, seems pretty ineffectual here overall compared to the power that you are you are left up against. So does take care of one teacher using the Moonfire, but there, there is still a teacher to spare here. And depending on what's picked up, do you ever cycle a Wrath on your own 1-1 one -one here? I was going to say no, but with the Living Roots as well, maybe? Yeah, I think I do. He, he thinks otherwise, but I, I feel that with the second Wrath in hand, and my hand, like, I've run out of things to do, I think that would have been interesting because it replaced itself anyway. Right. It's just two mana cycle, which is, you know, a famous priest card already does that. And I think I'd have been okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, you, you definitely don't cycle it on your own teacher because that exposes your teacher to swipe mm -hmm. um, when your opponent only has four mana, so can't fit the hero power in as well. But again, like your 1-1s one are just kind of residual swipe damage a lot of the time. And, you know, the 1-1 one -one replaces itself, the Wrath replaces itself in your hand. You still push a bunch of damage. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess from Cag's perspective, he's just saying he can ride this teacher all the way to the bank and that he's just going to remove everything that gets played for the next two or three turns and then that'll be, you know, GG basically by this by the time this teacher is connected a bunch of times. But if uh, Gun and Flame just continues ramping up and not playing stuff for him to, to target with these removal spells, like, when does the breaking point come in terms of, right, I have to play it now? Right, and... It's not like he's forcing through chunks of damage like he would like to be here. That Wisps is an interesting option. Just breaking my train of thought there because with with the potential for all these, if he feels that he doesn't get swiped, Wisps is completely crazy uh, because he can set up a board with Teacher and one ones. And obviously if that doesn't get dealt with, then he just wins. But if it does get dealt with, he can reposition himself by playing the Wisps and not expect a second swipe. Yeah, it's definitely valid. It's a long way away though, and he has he has some turns to fill before then, and he has to be thinking about the the counter punch that's going to come back from his opponent here at some point because his opponent has just ramped up way ahead of him. And I said right at the start of this matchup that you prefer the consistent mana than the one off spikes mm -hmm. at the innovate, and you can see the damage this teacher has done. We are looking at what thirty two to sixteen right now, right. thirty two to fifteen. The other 16, teacher did three so... damage, so it's done eleven damage basically. Um, um, so yeah, you can you can see what that means, but like the long term pushback, if Gundam Flame can stabilize, is so much in favor with the druid who's had the the hard ramp effect. If he can find a way to stabilize, you know, Cag has to find some way to mitigate that or to push through right now. But I don't think either of the options, Invite or Feral Rage, were going to enable him to do that. Yeah, Gundam Flame dropping this, but he sighs as he plays it. I think he's... Oh! Wow. Unlucky. <laughs> yep, I think he's unlucky is probably the correct ending to that. Um, but I think he was already resigned to the fact that Cag had a handful of damage because he's not played anything for a couple of turns of note. It's interesting. Now Now the Wrath does get cycled. Obviously, he doesn't kill one of his own 1-1s one here. He's, sure. he's an extra 1-1 one -one ahead of where he would have been if he'd have done it. But that, that Wrath achieved nothing except cycling a card. That's a Yashara. Yeah, and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to come into play this game, I promise. And this is the power of Mulch, right? So a lot of the time, it just gives your opponent a garbage card. Like yeah. a two three is a fairly standard garbage card of which there are a lot in Hearthstone, but mm -hmm. the times it gives them a really powerful card are often also the powerful card just can't be played. Yeah, because it's the same thing as like sapping Ragnaros, right? You've essentially mulched Ragnaros into Ragnaros, but the point is you've gained so much tempo in the process of doing that that your opponent can just never play Ragnaros again. Um, like. It, it, it doesn't really matter what card you give them a lot of the time, as long as you're using Mulch to push an advantage in mm -hmm. exactly this way that Kag is here. Yeah, and despite the fact he's never been able to catch up on mana, he has ridden out this tempo. Is that lethal? That should be lethal, right? That is six plus four plus four. Plus two. Yeah, he can win it. If... He hasn't got mana yeah, for seven. Yeah, he can but... do it in a variety of ways. I counted Power of the Wild plus Swipe, which is plenty to get the job done, but he can do it with any variety of cards that he wants. And that is a quick win for Cag. A quick win is exactly what he would have wanted there. But Gundam Flame still has two more chances to go back to the hill with arguably the strongest deck in the game. 
Right, and it turns out if you play Violet Teachers on turns one and two, that you, it's hard to kill them both. Who knew? Yep. Turn one, teacher. Turn two, teacher. And you, Narinda, put your neck on the line. Yeah. Saying the guy with double innovate, double teacher in his opening hand was going to win that matchup. And to the amazement of literally nobody, <laughs> you were correct. Something that is interesting about that is those double innovate starts that are obviously incredibly powerful. You usually win by falling over the finishing line, sort of flat on your face, out of gas. Yeah. Uh, because the, using the double innovate does have the downside that when your opponent comes back at you, obviously, you know, you, you've you've wasted in the most inverted of inverted commas ever two cards. Mm -hmm. But in this game, actually, Cag still had plenty going on when he got to the finishing line. Like he used the momentum he gained from having those teachers to get the card advantage back as well as the damage. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. he, he was he was patient about it as well. He could have started like digging his deck a lot earlier. We discussed at length the merits of just cycling wraths on your own one ones early on, and he said, "No, no need. I've I've got plenty of time here," and ended up being rewarded by uh, that little extra bit of pressure that he maintained through uh, through not wrathing his own minions. So the production guys have got the deck list. So I reckon we're ready to go into game six in this best of seven. Uh, round of 16 in the Japan preliminary. The winner of this preliminary, concluding tomorrow, will go to APAC on the 30th of September to represent Japan. And this time, Kag has Silverware Golem, but he still has clunky stuff alongside it. And yeah. this time, Gundam Flame has the Innovate and the Teacher. Yes, he does. So, Neil, with your incredible levels of insight into win rates of players that draw Innovate, who do you like? from this situation right here. Uh, so I, <laughs> I think Zoo's pretty good against Druid, especially the newer versions, but I'm going with Gundam Flame and the Innovate Teacher <laughs> because I'm a brave soul. Right. There, there's, there's kind of... Uh, Druid exists in their own kind of sphere of the universe, right? Where yes. it's like, you can say, oh, this matchup is favoured against Druid. This deck is favoured against Druid. But... You know, being favoured against Druid and being favoured against Turn 1 Violet Teacher are very different things. <laughs> right. Yeah, Druid and Rogue just don't live in the Hearthstone universe. They they live in their own little universe and pay us a visit from time to time. And this is definitely going to be a visit from a pretty nonsense Turn 1. He is looking, can this die? And the answer is, if he sulfies me, who cares? Yeah, I mean, can this die? Well, yes, but... Will it die next turn if you coin hero power to all the same things? Yes. Like there, there's, it, You're just never going to increase your chances of your Violet Teacher living more than you are by just jamming it on the board right now. And when you have two two-drop spells in your hand, both of which look pretty tasty right now anyway, looks pretty good. And Gundam Flame in a position where if he keeps his nerve, he should be in a good position to advance to the last eight. Yep. And I like this. Um... Kag respecting the teacher oh. here, knows that he has to push through it, but that innovate is absolutely savage. So I don't see any reason why we don't see Wrath on the Direwolf innovate into the power of the wild, army of two twos against nothing versus Zoo on turn two. Yeah, I mean Gundam Flame is just considering his merits here, right? Sure. Like he he is thinking, okay, let's not get carried away. This draw is obviously amazing, but let's just take a step back for a second. You know, how do I deal with Imp Gang Boss next turn? How do I deal with Darkshire Councilman next turn? What are my opponent's expected plays? Is it ever better to hold on to this Innovate? He knows this is one of the most important games of Hearthstone he's ever played. So he is just considering all the lines and making sure that this is always going to be correct. But let's be real. Yeah. And I'd love just, to see this. I mean, just Innovate the power of the wild. The only danger here yeah. ever yeah. from... It's going to Innovate the hero power, Neil. This is actually really smart. Wow. Do you know what? I think he's found it. I think this is actually just a strictly stronger line. Because yeah, there's I no agree. reason to, there's no reason to develop the extra power right now, and he can just curve straight into Power of the Wild next turn if he needs to, and react more flexibly to what his opponent creates here. And he also doesn't reveal the fact that that is a full power teacher. That right. is a full power teacher. That Imp Gang boss does nothing, but it looks like it's great. That concealed information of the power of the wild means 
everything in this situation. That was a spectacular turn. I mean, to make a play that just looks awful, like at first instinctive glance, compared to, hey, let's just have an army of two twos, which we were both comfortable with. We were just saying yep. he's taking his time, being careful. We weren't expecting him to come out with something that was better. And he did precisely that. And it's going to make sure he wins this game, almost certainly. Yeah, that is going to be the icing on the cake. Uh, you don't want to call things too early in, in our job, but sometimes yeah. it's hard not to. And if there is one thing Zoo is incapable of doing, it's climbing back onto a board that they are this far behind on. You know, Forbidden Ritual is a card that's being cut out. Doom Guard off the top next turn isn't going to be enough to fight back. Like there's, It's just hard to imagine a world. Yeah, and I, I'm excited to see that play. I think we... We take so many things for granted in Hearthstone that when somebody just spots a play like that, in the heat of the action, I mean, that's either incredible preparation or incredible insight into the game. Uh, to, to just spot that I don't need to rush this. Against Zoo, I don't need an extra minion right now. That That's a good thing to spot just right there. I'm, I'm so impressed, as you can probably tell, that... How does he... Wow. Ouch. <laughs> words, words, words. I've run out of In words. English, Neil. Do you speak it? Not anymore. You have been hired to provide an English rebroadcast right now. Speaking the language is fairly important. Ouch. And this innovate seems pretty good. But, I mean, Feral Rage will help him stabilise if somehow he gets behind on this five minion board. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Let's just kill yeah. everything. Yeah, like, innovate and swipe here means that we just start dropping A8s every turn. You have to trade off one of your 2-2s two to tidy up the rest of the board. I mean, come on. Let's be real. It's just tidy up the board. And it does look like Gundam Flame is in an unlosable position. Unless there's some tech in Cag's deck that we don't know about. Yeah, unless he absolutely peels a random hellfire off the top of his deck right now into two back-to-back -back big game hunters in his zoo warlock <laughs> yeah yeah basically what we're trying to say is this is this over. game and this series is done and gundam flame is going to be walking his way through to the round of eight defeating a man that you told me was a potential favorite and i will bow to your knowledge of the the eastern scene and say that you have done your research and you know that this guy has what it takes. So this is an, a very impressive victory for Gundam Flame. Yeah, and he's taken it well as well. Um, when in his notes he says things like, I want to do better than last time. And that's why I've come back and that's what I've, I've strived for. You sometimes wonder if people are piling too much pressure on themselves. Yeah. But he's come back there and performed admirably and spotted a fantastic play in the game that's going to win him the match. So he is definitely, I think going to be one of the contenders based on that victory who he's played against how he's played it yeah extremely well played um by gundam flame but again let's 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 just harp on this point one more time i think um without going through and making the hard count again i think five zoo decks out of 16 players in this tournament which is incredible because yeah. that number's normally 14 plus two renos Right. Very, very underrepresentative. The the warlock class in general. I don't think yeah. there's a single Reno lock. There yeah. are there are five there are five zoos and that is all the warlocks out of sixteen players. So a deck that has not been trusted by the Japanese scene here and a player that you said had a very good chance mm -hmm. chose to be one of those players to bring it with them. And we saw him fail with that deck three times. Three out of his four losses were with that zoo deck. And that is pretty bad news for everybody who's brought zoo is going to be wondering now well ouch uh so what i believe is going to happen we're casting four games today four matches today four best of sevens and the logical assumption from that we are getting from you know we're just going from the japanese feed and making it up as we go to some degree but the logical assumption is that we'll get two quarterfinal matches after these two 16s that we've just done yeah, I mean, we saw, I'm not sure if you caught the, the bracket flash up while we were on break, but we saw one of the off-stream games, Yugo beat uh, Mariko off-stream, mm -hmm. so Yugo has, has progressed through, and we'll, we we will await the result of the other off-stream game that will have been going on simultaneously with this one, um, but then they will, of course, uh, round out our, our round of eight in this situation. 
Um, and then, yes, we would predict if things progress in a, in a logical fashion that we will be moving on and bringing you some, some round of eight games after this. Right, so just going to stay with you guys until the adverts start, at which time we'll pause the broadcast from our point of view. We'll let you guys enjoy the Japanese adverts and <laughs> we will come back um, as soon as the next match starts. And from what we've seen, unless there's a little break between rounds, the turnaround's been pretty quick so far. Yeah, it's not been bad. Uh, the players pretty much get themselves sat down, uh, a little bit of admin interaction to make sure everything is uh, is you know above board with all the, the, the rules and checks and balances and stuff, but... They seem to be getting uh, turned around in between games pretty quickly. So hats off to them. Okay, I'm going to assume that we're going to go to adverts. I'm going to put on the sound. And we'll see you guys in however minutes soon it turns out to be.